Zemf. Zemf is the German word for mustard. A condiment bold in color and taste and not at all like the subtle and sophisticated reconstructions of actual historical performances that John Q. Walker of Zemf Studios can coax out of old uh, 78s roller pianos, 33 and a third vinyl, you name it, John can call it forth from the past. John Walker is another one of these uh, fusion meisters uh, who has combined degrees in music, in math, and in computer science. And by the way, that was Glenn Gould. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. What a pleasure to be here. Uh, we've had some amazing presentations the past few days on the visual side, and I kind of want to show you the immersive technology that's now possible on the audio side. You've just been able to sit in the room as Glenn Gould played the piano again live. Um, let me start off with a couple things. I suspect most of you who are Torontonians, especially, and Canadians, understand who Glenn Gould is. Um, in the American audience I present to sometimes, it's kind of, I need a little bit of introduction. Um, a fantastic pianist who's still remembered and still will be remembered for many more years because what he brought to music was ideas. He played interesting, imaginative performances, and every time he played, he could think of a different way to do it. Um, he retired from the concert stage in 1964 at the age of 32 because he said he felt like a vaudevillian. He couldn't, you know, he couldn't con convey what he wanted to frozen on stage. And he said, what I'll do is I'll focus on recorded technology from now on. So he was really the pioneer in saying the performance, the recording, these are, the, these are what represent my art, and they'll last long into the future. Um, so he meticulously edited in the piece that we heard there. It's called the aria, it's the introduction. There's an edit in there, and uh, I won't stop and, and do the spot. But you can tell, not from listening to the recording, but you get up to a place in the music, and right at a bar line, the tempo increases ever so imperceptibly. So this is one of the things we do in our analysis. You know, it's maybe 0.2% faster, but it occurs at a specific spot, and so clearly, there's a tape edit at that spot in the original recording, because he said, I need, you know, here was a good part of the performance, and I'm going to stick to it, this other good part. And they didn't precisely match in tempo. And when you hear it live over and over again, the spot becomes very clear, because no human would change tempo in that way at that precise spot. And so kind of what I'm going to talk to you about is, you know, what does it mean to be human, and what does it mean to be able to kind of replicate these things? The second thing I want to talk about is listening you know, to, as people who listen to headphones and speakers and audio files and those kinds of things, that says performances, the things that are recorded, are truly unique, but the older they are, the worse they sound to us. Yes, you know, recordings from 80 years ago are just as valid as they are today, but they sound old. Now, whose fault is that? Well, the recording engineer at the time used the best gramophone he could, right? The, Glenn Gould was recorded in mono there. He used the best one microphone that he could because that's what we recorded it, it was in mono. And now 50 years later, it sounds old because we've got much more sophisticated sound. And so there's this thing that happens that says we freeze the recording in time with the best equipment you have, and yet your listeners may be 50 or 100 or 500 years into the future with the best equipment they have. And the recording sounds quite old. So our idea, you know, come here and show you what, what we've done, is to separate the performance as a thing that's separate from the recording, from the medium itself. We asked ourselves this question that says, what would it take to be able to sit in the room as Glenn Gould played again? Now, in 1964, I was eight. I never had the opportunity to do this. Uh, I have met some people at this conference who actually heard Glenn Gould play live, and I'm so honored kind of have to have met you. Uh, and I've been just treated so well in Toronto by the Gould Estate and the Gould Foundation because we've really been able to replicate him just kind of right down to the moment. Um, what would it take in order to do this? Well, the more we looked at this, it means we had to actually solve the hardest problem in music technology. That says we needed to go backwards from recordings to the notes that they were made of. 
Now, as Moses introduced me, he said, I'm a software guy. And yes, I am a hardcore PhD software engineer and also have a piano degree. But for any software person, the hardware has to get good enough. And goodness gracious, Yamaha did a remarkable job with this thing. Now, you probably may have heard of Yamaha Disclavier's before, but you may not have heard of this special model called the Disclavier Pro, and that's what we have here on stage. It's really 10 times the precision, and it really kind of makes all these nuances and the things that we did here possible. And then our business is we convert the sound waves, you know, which look like everything that happened at the moment of recording. You, you've got all the air and everything happening in the room and all the squeaks and all those kinds of things, and discover every single note and how it was pressed and how the pedals were pressed down, and, uh, and that's what we do as a business. Crossed a line from, it's not in the style of Google. It's not, oh, it's kind of like gold plate. No, no, that, that really is. And, you know, I'll kind of prove to you how it's kind of exactly replicated the whole thing. It's a lot of fun. It's uh, just a pleasure to meet a lot of interesting people who are so well-educated and well-informed and have great ideas. The piece you heard was called the Goldberg Variations. And it was commissioned by Bach, from Bach, in 1941. Bach was in the last decade of his, his life. He died in, in, in 1750. This is the only time, except a real juvenile piece, this is the only time Bach wrote variations. There's 32 tracks in this thing. It lasts, uh, you know, well, different versions. Um, and it's all in the key of G, although a few pieces are in key of the key of G minor. So just, you know, but it's, again, all in the key of G. And Gould recorded it twice. It was the first album that he made as a commercial uh, performing artist. And it was the last, nearly the, it was the thing that was released actually the, just a week after he died. For us, the, 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 uh, the challenge of picking our first piece, our, our, our first commercial recording, we picked this one because so many people have it memorized. They know every single note. If I had, you know, the, if the machine here <laughs> had it failed in any way, you would know this. And so I kind of don't have to do a before and after of this recording. Now, that's not quite fair to all of you who haven't heard it all before, but I'm going to offer you an opportunity to buy it again in the future. So, anyway, <laughs> the, the recording's been in continuous print since January 3rd, 1956, and it's been on LPs, and it's been on 8-track and cassette and CD and even Super Audio CDs, but it's locked in mono. And we said if there's ever a way to get it out of mono, we've got to start over again and be able to replicate all the notes. Uh, and we just did the right thing again. So let me talk, talk to you not in any depth about our technology that says we uh, start with the recording, and again, it can be a record, it can be a CD or something, but we load whatever it is into a waveform in the computer. So it sits there on the hard drive in some kind of digital format, and then we do a very extensive analysis discovering every note and how every note was played. It turns out there's about 10 different things you have to discover on every note. Um, the microsecond it was pressed down, and how hard it was pressed, and how long it was held down, and how you picked your finger up at the end of the thing, and what time that occurred, and where the pedals were when all these things occurred, and the notes that occurred before it because it causes some overtones, and where the dampers are, and these kinds of things. And so that's kind of the, uh, the, the thing that we look at when we do this analysis. Uh, just so you know, it is not completely automated at this point. There's still some things we don't understand how to do yet, but we're kind of pushing the, the technology forward as, as, as well as we can. For example, one of the things we don't know how to do automatically is decide what the real dynamic range was. Okay, so you get a recording that, you know, it, from the softest note to the loudest note, it appears about to be this much. Yet a real piano can do this much. And so how do you expand what happened in the recording into what should be reality? And we use very, you know, like PhD music, musical uh, talents for this to be able to do that kind of mapping. Uh, and then we end up with something called high resolution MIDI. So if you've heard of MIDI before, that's the interface between music, musical instruments and computers. We can't run it over MIDI cable because it's not fast enough. So we, have, we need to do the measurements in microseconds. So it's a computer that's all integrated into the computer, in, into the piano. This is the same piano that Harris played on Wednesday morning, <laughs> but little did you know, it's full of Linux underneath and hard drives and solenoids and fiber optics, beautifully disguised, because it's still you know, a, a beautiful concert grand there. Um, and we code exactly down to the level of the computer, and then you can start with a new recording all over again. 
So, some observations. Um, and then I'll talk about some of the implications as well. First, I, I dare say that your reaction was, wow, that's ghoul playing. I mean, Moses kind of told you uh, the, at, the, at the beginning, but uh, if you know this piece, there's this real visceral reaction of, gosh, that's really him playing. Um, for us, in, you know, in, in marketing terms almost, we crossed a line from, it's not in the style of Gould. It's not, oh, it's kind of like Gould playing. No, no, that, that really is, and you know, I'll kind of prove to you how it's kind of exactly replicated the whole thing. And the key step that makes this different from, oh, I don't know, player pianos and some things that we've seen historically in the past is that we can get to the micro timings. What musicians spend their life doing is this very careful practice to cause the emotion to occur, and it has to do with the timing. Think about all the things that have to occur when you play music. There's the timing and the loudness and the notes and all those kinds of stuff. Well, it turns out timing's 90% of what the emotion is. And if you get the timing ragged enough at a microscopic level, it sounds human, it sounds natural. Whereas if the timing is exact, like a drum machine, it sounds like a drum machine. And so we kind of head across an interesting line here of, of being able to code at, uh, at the right level. Second question, observation, which is, how do we know when we're done? Um, and we had to discover what that was going to be because we've got two different things that aren't the same. You know, we've got this original recording and then we've got an instrument here in the room. And so the first time we got Gould playing, we all sat in the room and said, wow, that was great, that was beautiful. And then we wanted to fix it. Oh, let's make that note a little longer. Oh, I don't think the pedal's quite right there and stuff. That you would do by ear as a musician. You go, oh, that sounds fun, let's adjust it. And that was dead wrong. Okay, because the only historical document, the only evidence we have is the recordings themselves, and our challenge then is to match the recording exactly, and we do that out of the room. We make a new recording, and we take the old recording, and we have to match them up exactly. Now, if we go back in the room and we don't like how it sounds, too bad, because that's what the piano had to do in order to make the recording happen. So kind of a kind of interesting step here, and I'd like to kind of show you that step here. On your right, will be a new recording of what you just heard. And on your left will be Gould's original. And this will start playing, and then we'll pan over to this one, and then they're both gonna play at the same time. So in the center, you'll hear both of them at the same time. In a very weird acoustical effect, you know, 50 years separates them <laughs> in two different rooms, two different instruments, every variable is different, and you'll, you'll see it's the same thing. Thank you. That's where we know we're done. <laughs> <laughs> You'll wish Glenn was here because it's one of these where he's flying along with his right hand and his left hand's crossing over. And you'll be able to see the crossover and the spectacular level of playing. The content was fascinating. It's a, a combination of an intellectual challenge and a World's Fair uh, scientific show. So, some implications. Performances can be malleable. Like I said, we treat them as historic documents, but if you've read about Gould and his approach to technology, he would love the fact that we can do all kinds of interesting things now, not related to tape splicing. And it says we can adjust the timing of the notes and adjust the pedaling and adjust the phrasing all after the fact. We can take two dissimilar takes recorded in different rooms, go back and decode them back to the instrument, and glue them together because you can take things from different acoustic spaces. We can adjust tempos, which I haven't done, but again, you can match tempos from one performance to another and make them one seamless thing. Um, same thing with dynamic range and pitch like that. Second thing is the recording engineer now becomes an artist <laughs> because we've separated the performance from the recording and we can make brand new recordings again. 
But there ha doesn't have to be a final recording, does there? Because you can use the performance over and over again because the performance itself is repeatable. We can change the microphone placement. We can make you know, recordings that are suited for iTunes. We can make recordings that are suited for your home theater surround sound system. And as the recording technology gets better 10 years from now, make a brand new recording again. Because the performance, and the phrase for this, the performance is now a renewable resource. Think about that. In summary, record everything. <laughs> right? It's not the recording that's of value, it's the thing that you recorded. And people will come along in the 21st century and make that into something very immersive and more interactive. This says it's more malleable, you can change it, and so on. Um, thank you. I want to leave as the last word here, three more variations from Glenn himself. Um, if you don't know these, this time I get a chance to inter introduce them. I told you there was 30 variations. Every third one is a cannon, and a cannon's like row, row, row your boat, right? But it says you start it up, and then you can start it again in another place, and it all comes together. So we're gonna start with variation number three, which is where we left off, and it's a cannon. It's just delightful. Bach at his finest writing. Number four is a very Baroque dance that's very loud. It's the loudest piece in the Goldberg variations. And number five, you'll wish Glenn was here, because it's one of these where he's flying along with his right hand and his left hand's crossing over. And you'll be able to see the crossover and the spectacular level of playing. Thank you very much. Thank you.